Okay, I'm just going to cut to the chase here. Let me give you the punchline before we start. Data is always lying to you. It is always lying to you. But we can fix it sometimes, maybe. If you take the data as it is given to you and you treat it as though it is telling you the truth, you're applying a model. You may not know it. That's even scarier. You're applying a model which assumes that the data that you have is a perfect representation of the thing you think you're talking about. That's often called the naive model. And there's a reason that we have a pejorative term for it, okay? Because it's not right. So you can't use data in its raw form. That will be the thing I am trying to convince you of today. This is not a new debate. This was a debate that was had in mathematical statistics from the teens to the 30s last century. And they solved this debate. And the answer was, big data doesn't work. But now we have so much more big data, we've completely forgotten the lessons of mathematical statistics in the 20th century. So I want to tell you how horribly wrong it can go. And I'm going to give you four examples today, but that's just because we only have 45 minutes to talk about it. I have a lot more examples. In fact, I'm not even going to present the examples that we presented two days ago at the NYU conference on the tyranny of the algorithm. Because every place we've ever been able to look Every single time we've been able to figure out the relationship between observable data and the patterns that we're trying to estimate, they're different. And you know what? If we're trying to get the right answer, that's a problem. Hey, who in here cares if they're right? <laughs> yeah, see, not all the hands are up. And you know what's really interesting is that not only are not all the hands up, but I am often in contexts where people actively argue that they don't care if they're right. Let's talk uh, about the UN at some point. I don't mean OHCHR, I mean the Security Council. Um, and Congo, MONUSCO, how many homicides are there in Congo? MONUSCO's mandate connected to that. Happy to talk more about it. Look, I've been at this for about 25 years, and with my colleagues at the Human Rights Data Analysis Group, We've worked in over 30 countries. We worked for truth commissions. We advised and wrote the databases and calculated the statistics for nine truth commissions for, uh, at this point, six war crimes trials and tribunals and national jurisdictions as well, uh, four UN missions. Um, and I am not making a cynical old joke when I say some of my best friends work at the UN. I'm quite serious. The UN, I'm, I, I think, are heroes uh, in, in the human rights space, as well as the people who are doing the hardest work of all, the human rights activists on the ground who are documenting everyday violations. And from all this work, what we've learned is that in human rights data collection, we don't usually know what we don't know. That's a problem. If you don't know what you don't know, how do you know if what you don't know is systematically different from what you do know? And if what you don't know is systematically different from what you do know, what the hell is your model doing? Now, I don't just mean a complicated machine learning model, which will have bias so complicated that we can't even reverse engineer it. No, 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 no. I mean counts. If we don't know what we don't know, and we compare two different counts, how do we know that the count that seems bigger is actually bigger? Or if the count that seems bigger is just representing the people we talk to, and the other people who don't like us for any number of reasons didn't tell us their story, well, that's the low bar. You know, we got a big bar and a little bar. We think the little bar is because it's little. No, it's because they don't like us. All right? They don't trust us. They may have good reasons not to trust us. They may think that we are allied with their enemies in a long-standing conflict. They may think that we are going to steal their data and use it in a way that will hurt their community. They may have any number of very good and valid reasons for not sharing their information with us. Statisticians would call that selection bias, and that's the fundamental piece that I want to underline again and again through the course of this talk. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here, and let me, as I go through this talk, try to underline the stakes for ignore, of, of, of ignoring selection bias. What happens if we pretend that's not the case? What happens if we pretend that data is actually telling us a story? By the way, if you want to tweet, please tweet at HRDAG. I should have said that at the beginning. Um, let's imagine that we collect and combine three databases. Okay? And this is a really cool kind of data science-y hack to do. It's called record linkage or sometimes database deduplication. It's a really fun and, and extremely cool hack. Uh, that turns out to be incredibly complicated, which uh, is, makes it super fun. Um, but let's say we combine these databases. Let's say, hypothetically, okay, it's not that hypothetical. Um, let's say these are people who've been killed in the Civil War in Peru between 1980 and 2000. Okay? And what we want to know is, how many of them are there? And the first question we ask is, how many names do we have? How many people can we identify who've been killed in this war? 
So we get these three databases, maybe one's from the Truth Commission, one's from the Defensoria del Pueblo, the, the, the group that uh, documented deaths on the part of the state, uh, you know, for compensation for the state, and one is from the NGOs. And we combine these databases and we have those three circles. We're living in the world of those white circles, the intersecting white circles. We can determine who has been multiply documented, we've deduplicated properly, we have a unique count of deaths. Sweet. Hang on. Are we living in the world here on the left, or are we living on the world on the right? Are we living in the world where we know about a third of the victims, or are we living in the world where we know almost all of them? Eh, maybe it doesn't matter. One death is too many, right? I mean, that's sometimes a, a response that we get, but the problem is we don't just care about the number, we care about the comparison. Statistics is rarely about the magnitude of an event. That's not actually all that interesting. What's interesting is the pattern, the relationships, the contrast between different categories. And in Peru, the key contrast that we, work, we were working on and that continues to be one of the key questions for historical memory today is what are the relative proportions of responsibility for the violence among the two key perpetrators, the Peruvian army and Sendero Luminoso, the mouse gorillas of Sendero Luminoso. That's the key question. So if you live in the world of these white circles, because of artifacts of how we collected the data, we would have falsely concluded that the number of killings was approximately equal between those two parties. And we would have been wrong. We would have been wrong. Sendero Luminoso killed at least half again, potentially, depending on how you read the error bounds, twice as many people as did the Peruvian army. That's a big deal. And that's the scale of mistake that we make over and over again if we believe raw data. If we live in the world of raw data, we don't know what we don't know, and I assure you that what you don't know is systematically different from what you do know. Because there's a reason you know what you know. The reason that we have these correlations is that data does not fall from the sky. It is an incredibly rare and beautiful project that we have a random sample of the population. That's how it was solved in 20th century statistics. But I've been at this 25 years, and I've found it very difficult to, dead, to interview people who've died in political violence. That's very difficult. And building a retrospective mortality survey in which you interview people about their loved ones who have died, which we have done, creates a very complicated modeling problem because the sampling probability of the death is different than the sampling probability of the person you're interviewing. Chaos ensues, okay? It's very, it's, it becomes a really complicated hack, a complicated probability hack. So I'm going to talk in a few minutes about a formal probability-based model that will help us, one of many different kinds of formal probability models that will help us bridge this gap. But what I want to do before we transition into the next check into the first example is to talk, is to just really underline this point, that when I'm talking about models, I'm not talking about models that give us explanations. I'm not talking about machine learning models, which I totally love, and I would, happy to, 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 I would be happy to talk about tediously and endlessly over beers about whether, why it is that I think that gradient boosting is the coolest thing since. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about are models that help us understand sampling bias. I'm talking about models that help us figure out what's not in our sample. I'm trying to figure out why do we have this story instead of that story. So when I talk about models, that's what I'm talking about. Now, even without a model, there may be clues about how bias works. Okay? And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Iraq body count, which is a great database and a terrible source of statistics for statistical reasoning. The Iraq body count, for people who may remember, began right at the beginning of the, uh, of the occupation of Iraq, the invasion and occupation of Iraq, documenting people who died in the conflict. And their primary sources were press sources. They also have a couple other sources from the Iraqi government and then from WikiLeaks. And it's, it, WikiLeaks gives us a lot of leverage on this problem. The WikiLeaks, uh, WikiLeaks released the significant acts database, which is a database maintained by the US military of people that they knew about who died. I'm not going to go into that analysis here, uh, but I'd be happy to talk about it in the Q&A if there's, some, if there's uh, additional questions. Instead, I want to just ask about the data in the Iraq body count and say, okay, what if we divide the data in the database of the Iraq body count by the size of the event in which the victims were killed? Okay? So we're going to say, okay, we're going to create one pool of data for people who were killed in events of size one one at a time. We're going to create another pool of data, another stratum of people who were killed in groups of two to five. We're going to create another one of groups size six to 14, and then another one of groups size 15. Now, cool, we've divided up the data. 
Now let's ask ourselves a thought experiment. Let's pose ourselves an idea. And the idea goes something like this. What does it mean to not know about something in terms of having sources of data? Well, it means we have zero sources of data, right? I mean, if we have a source of data, we know about that thing. If we have two sources of data, three sources, four sources, five sources, we know a lot of details about that event. But if we have zero sources, we don't know. Okay? So the notion of a source and the count of sources gives us our first insight into what it means to have knowledge about the world. So what I've done in this graph, what Megan and I did in this graph, uh, is to count for each of the groups what is the proportion of that group that has a certain number of sources? So if we start over here in the far right, we see that there's a most, almost everyone, uh, every event of 15 or more victims was documented by 15 or more sources. When there's a big event in Iraq, everybody hears about it. Everybody hears about that event like that, and it's extremely well covered. And in fact, even the least covered events have two sources. So big events are very, very well covered. Smaller events, though, well, there's some number of those events that are covered by only one source, but still quite a few by a large number of source, sources. But when you get down to two to five, you start seeing that you, know, you, you, you get almost half of them that are covered by only one or two sources. And when you get to individual events where a single person is killed, more than three quarters of them are, killed, are, are covered by only one or two events. And a very substantial fraction, in fact, about a third, a little more than a third, are covered by only one event, uh, by only one source. So here's my question. What kinds of events are more likely to be covered by zero sources? Anyone care to venture a guess? Yeah, down here. Okay. Individual events are much, much less likely to be covered at all than large events. In fact, the probability of covering a large event is, to a first approximation, about one, which is you're going to get it. The probability of covering a small event is very small, somewhere between 0 0.2, 0 0.3 on that order. That's a big deal. Because you know what? These events are totally different. In fact, these events are representing actually different conflicts going on at the same time. The small events are, are committed, were committed primarily by Shia militias. The weapon of choice was a firearm. The victims were adult men. And the goal was ethnic cleansing. That's completely different than the large events, which were collateral, coalition collateral damage incidents, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, insurgent events. They were committed with IEDs, airstrikes and massacres. The victims were a random selection of the population in public, and the goal was destabilization or control in that, in that, uh, in that dilemma. So what happens if you systematically omit events of size one? I'm not going to suggest that the rise of ISIS is the result of bad data analysis. That'd be a little strong. But look. We turn to data analysis to, 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 as, a, as a check, as a reality check on our prejudices, on our presuppositions, on the things we think are true. We look to data analysis to figure out if we've got the story right. But if we build data analysis that just reinforces the story we've already told ourselves, we've not only learned nothing, we've anti-learned. We've developed certainty about the wrong conclusion. I often say that bad data analysis is much worse than no data analysis. This is why. Because bad data analysis strengthens your certainty in the wrong conclusion. That's disastrous. Now, look, if you're serving ads, yeah, whatever. We're not serving ads, OK? We're building cases for holding the most powerful people in the world accountable for their actions. And I, and I suggest that as we listen to people going around the room, a lot of us have stories that are in that direction. We are holding very powerful forces accountable for doing things that are unjust or unfair. We need to be right. We cannot create data analysis that leads to the wrong answer. Because what if they have really good data analysis? We'll be delegitimized. So for the people in here who said that ethics in data use or data analysis is one of their concerns, I would love it if in the Q&A you could say, hey, should we be talking about malpractice? Let's talk about that. I'm going to move on. By, by overstating the importance of large events relative to small events, naive statistics reinforced international biases about what was happening in Iraq. In fact, naive statistics failed to tell the right story. They got us going in the wrong direction. This is, this is a problem. So I'm going to end that example and move on, because time is short, and there's a lot of data to look at. Let's talk about police homicides in the United States. Okay? 
So last year, I mean, look, we've known for a long time that the FBI Supplemental Homicide Report, which reports on a tiny fraction of the homicides committed by police in the United States was a little tiny, tiny part of the puzzle. And activists, uh, including MappingPoliceViolence.org, have done a terrific job uh, using press sources, including the Fatal Encounters database and the Killed by Police database, to show us how much data is missing from the official accounts. But what was really interesting is that last year, the US Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Statistics released a report in which they tried to estimate how many people were missing from the official reports. This was really, this was a breakthrough. And uh, in HR DAG, we were delighted when this came out. We read this thing really closely. And what they said is they did the kind of analysis that I'm going to demonstrate in a minute. I'll walk you through the algebra in just a sec. But what they did is they put two databases together. They determined the part that was in between, the intersection in the Venn diagram, <coughs> excuse me, and they estimated how much fell outside those samples. And they came to the conclusion that from 2003 to 2009, and then 2011, because 2010 somehow fell out. I'm not exactly sure how all that happened. But in that, in that period, they estimated about 7,400 uh, police homicides. That's, that's a big step forward, okay? But it's not nearly enough. So let me walk you through the algebra, and then I'll tell you what Christian and I did to try to correct that, that estimate. So here's how the algebra works, okay? It's not, an, it's not an accident that I've been putting up all this stuff in terms of Venn diagrams, because I think the Venn diagram provides us the insight we need to figure out what I mean when I say we need a probability model to correct what it is that we're trying to argue. We have some population N, okay? These could be people killed by the police in 2011. Or it can be the number of people killed in homes uh, in uh, January of 2013, which is an example that's coming. Just sit tight, everybody. I'm getting there. We put the databases together, doing all kinds of really cool database deduplication tricks, record linkage stuff, and we determine that there's some number of them found in both databases. Now, we're going to do a little bit of elementary algebra here, a little bit of basic probability theory, and from this I'm going to talk about why this analysis, which is what the Bureau of Justice Statistics did, is not completely right. Why it's got some some weaknesses. There's a pop, there is a number n. We don't know it, but it's, but it's there. We have some project A, which is collected from the universe n, and we have another project B, a second project conducted independently, also selected from the universe n. We've put them together. We've determined that some fraction of those databases are in between. We'll call that m. Okay. Now, by Basic probability theory, the probability with which a death in project A is selected from the universe N is A divided by N. Okay? This is like throwing a coin, and if I ask you, what's the probability I've thrown a head? You can shout it out. I mean, I don't know. And it's one over two, right? Because I'm asking for a head, which is one of the two possibilities. Okay? Great. So the probability that a death in the universe N is selected by project B is B over N by the exactly the same logic. And we put them together, we know M. So the probability that a death is in M, that is the intersection of A and B, selected from N, is M over N. So far, so good, right? Here's the part where we get some leverage, because the probability of a compound event, that is an event made up of two independent events, is equal to the product of the first probability and the second probability. Let me unpack that. If I throw two coins, the probability that I've thrown two heads is One over four, right? And the reason you get one over four is because there are four options. Head, head, tail, tail, head, tail, tail, head. We're looking for one of those options. Head, head. One over four. But you can get there another, right, another way, and that is by taking the one over two that was the probability of the first head and multiplying it by the one over two that's the probability of the second head. That's what we're going to do here. Because m over n, which was the probability of falling here, is equal to the probability of falling in a and the probability of falling in B. Seventh grade algebra, we rearrange the terms, we now have a way to estimate N. I don't know, I hope you guys got chills. Do you get chills? Okay. Statistics is so great. Okay. Because now we know something we didn't know before. Now we have a way to estimate this population that we didn't know the size of. We know something about what we don't know. That's huge. And I no, there's a different accent I should say that in, but I'm from California, I can't do that accent. So. All right, 
this is a really big deal. The problem is there's an assumption hidden in there. Well, there's four, actually, and we can unpack them one at a time. But the assumption that's relevant here is that A and B are independent. Okay? That the probability of being captured in project A is independent of project B. Let me give you another metaphor to try to get you really grounded in this. Let's imagine that we have two rooms that are dark. We can't see inside those rooms, but we'd like to know which of the rooms is larger. And the only tool that we have for assessing the size of those two rooms is a handful of little rubber balls. Okay? The rubber balls have a curious property that when they bounce into each other, they make a little So we're going to throw the balls into the first room when we hear Okay, cool. Collect the balls, go to the second room. Which room's bigger? Why? They spread out. Yeah. Okay, now we've gone to 10th grade chemistry. Boyle's law. Okay, I mean, we're just, this is just spreading out, right? So the logic here is the same. We've taken these two databases, A and B, we've thrown them into this room N, and we're observing their collisions. And as we've learned, the ratio of the size of the, essentially the number of balls to the number of collisions gives us our estimate. But what if we threw those balls into the room, and the balls kind of like each other? They want to get friendly. So they're kind of zooming by, and they were going to miss, but they like each other, so they curve and they hit each other. Okay? And then they bounce around a little bit, and they come back and like, hey, buddy, boom! And they bounce off. And then they bounce around, and they hit each other again. And they bounce around, and they seek each other out. What you end up with is more clicks than you should if they weren't attracting each other. This is called list dependency. And it sounds something like this when you're documenting police homicides in the United States. When middle class people get killed in front of video cameras, the police are going to report it to the FBI, and the media is going to cover it. When poor people are, 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 are killed and their social network is afraid of the police and there's no video cameras, it's never going to show up anywhere. So you get a positive correlation in the probability of reporting these events. And therefore, the simple approach, A, B over M, underestimates N. N is too low. The Bureau of Justice, Statistic, Bureau of Justice Statistics estimate, as horrifying as it was, was still too low. We know this because we've done this all over the place. We've done this all over the world. And it turns out that if you use three systems instead of just two, three databases, you can correct for this problem. And if you use four, five, or six, there's all kinds of really cool math that'll allow you to get much, much better estimates with much relaxed assumptions. Now, we used those results. We calculated the pairwise list dependencies. Um, Christian and another colleague of ours derived a way to use uh, calculated list dependencies from other projects in an estimate of something else. So we said, okay, here's what the list dependencies mostly look like. Here's a range of them. And so if you apply those list dependencies to the estimates given by the BJS, and you correct that estimate, you get about, you go from 7,400 to 10,000. And that comes down to about 1,250 deaths per year committed by the police. But a third of the US jurisdictions report nothing. So there's zero probability of reporting in those jurisdictions. So very, very generally, this is not a true estimate, but in general terms, you can, you can figure there's about 1,500 deaths per year committed by the police. That's a lot. I'm going to leave it there and say, let's move on to Syria. In Syria, we're using a variant of this method, and we're using four different projects. And what we're showing in this graph with the shaded colors, is we're comparing two areas, Hama and Homs. And in these two areas, what we're doing in each bar, for the, well, there's one bar for each of four months from December 2012 to March 2013, we're showing how many sources we have at each level. So, you know, we've got like four sources down in the dark blue, and then we've got three sources, and then we've got uh, two sources, and we've got one source, and then we've got zero sources. We're using a variant of the math I showed in the previous slides to estimate how many deaths are documented by zero sources. We are correcting for the selection bias in this problem. And then there's an error whisker. Okay? Um, that's what I'm talking about, Mimi. We need some help with this, with this uncertainty representation. Going to need your help. I'm going to call you out in the next set of slides too, all right? <laughs> Thanks. Because this is not good enough. Not, not good enough. Um, but we did publish this in a magazine called Significance uh, last year. Here's the problem, and here's why I want to come back to our theme about data always lying to us. 
let's look at the curves, that is the trends over time, of the number of people killed in each of these two locations if we didn't know the estimates. Okay? So what we have to do is draw a line across the top of the light purple. And what it looks like is that in Hama, we have a consistent decline from the peak in December 2012. WTF. Well, that's pretty much okay. In, in, in Holmes, the pattern of the estimated deaths, the top of the light blue lines, more or less follows the same pattern as the deaths in the light purple lines. In, in Holmes, we don't have too bad a problem. Okay? You know, if we just use the raw data, we'd, we'd be underestimating the deaths, but we'd get the pattern roughly right. Not in Hama. In Hama, we would get the pattern completely wrong. We would miss this really huge peak right here. Huh. What happened in January of 2013? Turns out, the government retook Hama. Didn't hold it long, but they took it back. And when that happens, not only does the government kill a ton of people, but the human rights groups have a really hard time doing their work. Okay? So one of the things that I hope you take away from this talk is that data is the result of the work done by people who collect data. It is not some representation of the world. We would love if it were, it's not. Cut it out. Not. <laughs> okay. What we have to do is recognize that it's terrific work done by, very hard work done by the people collecting data. That's why I said the Iraq body count is a terrific database that, was, that is the result of extremely hard work done by the people in that team. That doesn't make it a good statistical representation of reality. Okay? And it's hard. Okay, I spent the 90s building databases all over the world, and I spent the 90s writing phrases like, according to testimonies given to the Truth Commission, look at this graph. Okay? I now call that the caveat fallacy. Okay? No one knows what your, fa what your caveat means. No one's going to remember it by the time they get to the conclusions. Raw data is incomprehensible. If you present a graph, people interpret it as a statistical inference. They interpret it no matter what you write, to tell them otherwise, they will interpret it as though it is a representation of true patterns in the world. And so will you, 20 pages later. Okay? So we just, there's no way. The caveat fallacy is, makes you feel good. In our team, we call that a thumb suck because you suck your thumb, nom, 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 feels good, I feel secure for a minute, doesn't help anything. Okay? So we shouldn't do that. Raw data? I'm going to make it worse. Let's move on to Colombia. And in Colombia, we have five data sources. Um, and these are data sources as diverse as press and NGO reports aggregated by a big NGO, uh, the National Police Homicide Registry, the Registry of Cadavers maintained by the uh, forensic medicine people, uh, military intelligence records of uh, people who've been killed in combat, uh, including people that the military kidnapped from slums, executed, dressed up in gorilla clothes, and pretends are gorillas. Yeah, great stuff. Those are called false positives. That's a huge scandal in Colombia. And uh, people reported by the, as, as homicide victims to the uh, National Attorney General's office. So five sources. Put them together, did the estimates. And the estimates here are represented by this blue line, but also by this kind of smeared out purple, which is a representation of open jargon, uh, a Bayesian estimate, a Bayesian posterior distribution. Okay? And we used this package, the DGA package, for those of you who are our heads, I recommend it. Christian wrote it. It's, it's incredibly great. Um, but it gives you a way to go from uh, deduplicated data of this kind to a Bayesian estimate of the total. Now this black line underneath shows you how many deaths in total were observed once we deduplicated across all those systems. And that looks, you know, for the most part, you know, not so bad. But then every once in a while, OMG, kaboom, huge peak, very much like Hama, right? A huge peak in estimated deaths that's completely missed by the observed data. Anyone know a little Colombian history, know what happened in 2005, 2006? Now, Valle, the, the state or department where this is happening in Colombia, is the state around the city of Cali. Um, anyone want to take a stab at what was going on in 2005 and 2006? Paramilitary demobilization. So paramilitary groups were, in theory, putting down their guns and, and laying down, you know, eliminating their structures and not doing their paramilitary thing anymore. 
ain't going to practice war no more. Yeah, not so much. What they did is change forms and then spend a lot of time killing each other. And because they were killing each other as they fought over turf, nobody documented it. Okay, because these guys have been killing people and hiding the bodies for a long time. So this crucial piece of Colombian history goes completely undocumented. And indeed, policy analysts interpret the mobilization as though it was a successful process reducing violence. Successful process reducing violence? That's what happens with bad data analysis. That's what's at stake here. Okay? It was disastrous. Why is this a big deal? Because we're negotiating another peace deal right now with the FARC, in which exactly the same deal is on the table. Uh-oh. Let's make it a little worse. Until, because... <laughs> Until we presented these data, no one had ever looked at these five data sets together before. Okay? Here's what they saw. That was the first data set. There's the second data set. Third, fourth, fifth. And there was this incredibly contentious debate in Colombia about the criteria with which someone should be included in a database. People fought just bitterly over which of these five database had, databases had the correct pattern. This one, this one, this one, this one, or this one. And the right answer is, they're all wrong. That was completely the wrong question to be fighting about. The right question to be fighting about is, who's not turning up in the, any of the databases? What's missing? That's the right question that we need to be debating, and that's the way we need to understand this history, because otherwise, we're just stuck. We're stuck not knowing when the paramilitary guys go crazy and start killing each other in huge numbers. Um, calling you out again, Mimi. Here's another representation of a very similar kind of data. Uh, this is in the same state. It's the same one with one of those three. Huh, how do I represent uncertainty in a Bayesian context? Help me out. Let's do something really beautiful. Um, and here's what, this is Bogota for the same, the same period. Again, same peak, completely missed, even in a big city, even a very, very, very dense big city. Totally missed. Okay, I'm heading toward conclusion now. I spent a lot of time in Guatemala with these guys, really good buddies of mine, working really hard at the International Center for Human Rights Research, documenting human rights violations from press sources, from other NGOs' work, and we went out in the field and did 6,000 interviews with victims of the state's violence against indigenous communities. We spent a lot of time doing it. Now, okay, we drank a lot of beer. There was some fun had. I'm not saying it was terrible. We had a great time, but it was extremely hard work, and this wall of paper behind us tells us that story. And you know what? We wrote a book. Well, we actually wrote three books out of it, um, one of which has my name on it. And raw data, however big, is not a good basis for a story. I'm not pointing my fingers just at other people. I'm pointing my fingers at my own work uh, in this whole, the whole first 12 years of my career. It doesn't matter if we're talking about Truth Commission testimonies, UN investigations, press articles, crowdsourcing, SMS streams. Mm -mm. NGO documentation, social media feeds, perpetrator records, government archives, state re agency records, refugee camp records. Raw data is good for cases. It helps you know about an individual story of violence. But if you aggregate it into a database and think you're getting the patterns, you're not going to get the patterns. What you're going to get is a beautiful graph about how the data was collected. And that's probably not what you want. So. If the point of rigorous statistics is to be right, or at least have a sense of how imprecise you are, because statistics is sometimes called the science of uncertainty, well, if you don't care if you're right, why bother with any rigor at all, or even evidence? Just make it up, you know? I mean, how would we all feel if somebody made a huge human rights claim with a video with blue screen, right? Wag the dog style, right? How would we feel about that? Is that good human rights research? Okay, let me tell you the story of Dungu. Dungu is a little town in Congo, in northeastern Congo, where there is a MONUSCO mission. MONUSCO is the UN mission in Congo. There is a MONUSCO office dedicated to tracking violence by the LRA, Lord's Resistance Army, which is a really important perpetrator in that region. It's probably seventh or eighth most important perpetrator in that region. Most of the others are governments above that. But let's focus on the LRA, because that's way more politically easy. Right. So I know a bunch of the people who work in that office. 
I was one of the people who aggregated their statistics in 2010. And they work hard. These are really serious field investigators. They know a lot about the region. They know what they're doing. They work really hard. They do a terrific job. Their case analysis is terrific. It is first rate. It is first rate. But then, then those cases are aggregated in Kinshasa. They're sent to New York. And New York uses those as one input to make a decision about whether or not violence in Congo is getting better or getting worse. Okay? Here's the problem. Again, these people are doing fantastic work. They are doing excellent casework. They are not statisticians. Okay. UN rules say that if you're working in a uh, very challenging environment, you have to take two weeks of R&R, &R, rest and recreation or recuperation, or rest and relaxation, or another R. Two weeks every eight. Okay? And offices make a big effort to try to have a constant level of staffing in those offices, but it doesn't always work. And if you only have six or seven people in the office, every once in a while, four of them are going to be gone. And here's a shocker. The statistics you report to New York for that month are going to go down. Now, the people in Kinshasa know that. Okay, when we aggregate those data, we'll call out to Dungu, and Dungu will be like, yeah, yeah, sorry, man, everybody's on R&R, &R, doing the best we can here. And we're like, yeah, yeah, understood, understood, good. Hey, in terrific case stuff, could you look up five, six, and seven, those five footnotes, could you please go nail those down, we need verification? And they're like, we're on it, we're on it, cool, right on. Then it gets to New York. And they're like, hey, look, statistics went down. Guys, people are making policy on this. Okay. So, sometimes we think that if we have really big data, this problem goes away. Hmm. No. Technology and big data tend to amplify bias. They do not damp it. And the reason is that technology gives you more information about the stuff you were able to capture in the first place. But it doesn't address the problem that some of those areas are just, are just dead zones in terms of information. Some locations, some ethnicities, some perpetrator types, some kinds of violence, those are just going to be dead zones for you. But when you create more and 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 more, it's big, big, big data. You can delude yourself into thinking, well, it's so big, I must have a representative sample. Not at all. Not at all. It gets worse. It doesn't get better. So this is a huge problem. I also want to just come back and flag before we go to the conclusion that statistics is generally about comparisons. We're not actually as interested in the magnitude, that sometimes gets, that's good for a, a little bit of press reporting, but it doesn't tell you the story. Each of the four examples I presented, with the exception of the police story, which really was about magnitude, but three of the four are about comparisons among categories. Those may be categories over time, they may be categories over ethnicity, they may be categories by perpetrator, they may be categories by whatever the historically relevant piece of that particular context is. Those are the stories we need to tell. And if we don't have a way to tell those stories by comparison, well, that's, that's the real issue with bias, because bias will tend to affect some of those categories more than others. You have three ways to good statistics. You gotta be in one of these three ways. You can have a perfect census, which is what we're generally assuming when we talk about big data. We think we have all the data. We don't. But you have to be able to demonstrate that you have all the data. There are a vanishingly tiny number of cases in human rights where we do have all the data. The Humanitarian Law Center in, in, uh, in Yugoslavia has done what I consider to be a perfect census of the people killed in Kosovo between 1998 and 2000. That's amazing. That's incredibly amazing. It only took them 11 years for a conflict that involved about 16,500 victims, a place that is three hours drive from their office, a place that is very highly literate and had really excellent records before the conflict started. Every condition was in place. It took them 11 years for a relatively small conflict, and they were able to do it. That's not usually the kinds of things we're worried about. If we're worried about Syria, if we're worried about Congo, if we're worried about Colombia, we have one or more of those conditions not, not, not applying. Another way that we can get really good data is through a random sample. So you can draw a random sample of the underlying population. This turns out to be really hard, because it's really, really hard to define what our population is, much less figure out a way to randomly sample from it. It's not impossible, and often there's some way to get to it, but it takes an awful lot of statistics, an awful lot of very hard thinking about how that sampling is going to work. Finally, we can do posterior modeling of the sampling process, and there's several different approaches to this. My colleagues and I use one called multiple systems estimation, which is, the, which is a version of what I showed you in the toy example uh, with the intersecting circles. 
there are many more. Please do not get me wrong. Ours is not the only way whatsoever to do this kind of adjustment. There are many other kinds of adjustment. This just happens to be the one that we use. And so I know it well enough to explain it, but there are a lot of others. And let me leave you with this. We gotta get the story right, okay? If we're going to court, we wanna hold the powerful accountable, we'd be, be, we'd be ready for adversarial challenge. You know, and I've lost one. We gotta win. This is Edgar Fernando Garcia. He was a student and labor organizer in Guatemala in the late 1970s and early 1980s, and he's there with his wife and their infant girl. In February of 1984, he left his office, didn't turn up at home, disappeared. His wife, frantic, called the police, called everyone she could find, spent months looking for him. Okay. A couple of people were like, yeah, I, I think we saw him forced into a, an unmarked civilian car by guys in civilian clothes, and they drove away. That's all I got. She founded the Grupo de Apoyo Mutuo, one of the most important human rights groups in, in Guatemala, and she went on to become a really important politician in Guatemala. She never stopped looking for her husband. Okay? In 2006, an archive turned up in Guatemala. It turned out to be the archives of the National Police. And through the course of that work, there were documents found that indicated that the police had conducted a search and seizure operation in the region of the city where Mr. Garcia went disappeared, was disappeared on the day of his disappearance. We did a bunch of statistical work on that case, sampling from documents from the archive showing that the documents in the Garcia case are in every important way statistically indistinguishable from the mass of documents in the archive. The reason that's important is that the operation in which Mr. Garcia was disappeared by the national police was policy and practice. This was a standard bureaucratic operation. There was nothing weird or unusual about it. And so the two guys who were convicted of the disappearance of Mr. Garcia, the, the, the material agents of his disappearance, they said in their defense, as almost every perpetrator in history ever has, I was just following orders. And the judge was like, thank you very much for that. Guilty, that's not a defense. But by the way, Madam Prosecutor, if you could continue the investigation, find their boss and build a case of command responsibility against him. And this is Hector Bol de la Cruz, the man who was the director of the National Police, and I testified in his trial. Again, showing that the documents were part of policy and practice. They were completely consistent with the practice of the National Police. The disappearance of Mr. Garcia was not an anomaly in any way. He was also convicted. After the conviction of the material agents, this little girl thanked her grandmother. Because we need accountability in human rights cases so that people know when to speak of their loved ones in the past tense. We need accountability for human rights violations because it's the only thing that will stop the cycle of violence. It's the only thing that will stop the powerful from repression against the, the less powerful. And if we are going to do data analysis on behalf of projects that work for justice against inequality, for environmental, uh, for, for, uh, against environmental degradation, or for any of other of the many causes that we need to support, we have to be right. To do otherwise is malpractice. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Um, so I want to open it up to questions. Thanks so much, Patrick. This was just a phenomenal talk. Um, it was fascinating. There's so much in here. Um, and I, so one of the strong priors, I think, of the work <laughs> that you guys are doing, um, that you brought up both at the beginning and end of your talk, so I think you'll agree, is like the need to be right, right? Mm -hmm. Like this like imperative for accuracy. Like you asked us if it was important, you say at the uh, end that this is like the paramount thing for you. I wake up in the middle of the night a lot. Worried, right? Sweating. So I want to push a little bit on why it's important to be right, mm -hmm. because you ha actually have, I think, lots of different justifications for accuracy in the like that you brought up in the last hour, and I wonder if they differ or if like if different justifications demand different statistical analysis or different um, kind of balances of risks and benefit as you're making your determination. So mm -hmm. like I counted five different way reasons why you think it's important to be right. And I'll just tell you what they are really fast. Oh, cool. OK, so one. <laughs> To make a comparison, right? So you mentioned like sometimes right. you need to know like comparative, comparison, right? Right, obvious. One, which actually I don't know if you said this, is to meet out 
um, like punishment proportionally, which maybe doesn't come up so much in the case of mass accountability. atrocity. Accountability. We talk about proportional accountability. It's right. not so much punishment, but it is proportional accountability. Okay. Sure. That's the Peruvian case. Right, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. The third one I wrote down was um, to create an impression of magnitude around which to build policy, right? So maybe you need to convince people that there are, right. you know, X number of people that have... 10% of raped. all homicides in the United States are committed by police. Precisely. Right. Okay. Number four, because there's a normative reason, and actually this, you didn't say this explicitly, but I read this from your last example, mm -hmm. that maybe human dignity just requires it, that if someone dies, we ought to know, like we ought to count I have life. a great anecdote about that. Yes. Okay. And then the last one, which is also implicit, is that you're a statistician, and so it's your job to care about this stuff. <laughs> right? Like statisticians yes. care about that. Right. So the question I have based on this, and I apologize, guys, like I hate questions that are like long like this, but like I, all of those, I see all of those, but I wonder if each of those like leads you in a different direction, right? Like in, in particularly because of what you brought up that all of this is actually about collecting data in some cases, collecting data in the wild, you know, like via like human rights work, like workers on the ground, like going and doing stuff. And I wonder if like the, the imperative towards accuracy plays out differently when you when you acknowledge that like getting a more accurate count has actual social effects on the ground, either for the victimized population or for the people who are doing the reporting. Mm -hmm. Like it may be that, you know, knowing that 9,000 people versus 10,000 people died is like matters or doesn't matter based on the context, right? Or based on what your normative assumptions are about like the need to count, why we do counting. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to toss that to you. Counting and estimating. Counting and estimating. Yes. Um, I think they might play out, but I'm not sure that in the, in the big picture they play out in different ways. I think they might play out in specific, uh, in, in narrow ways that lead to maybe slightly different sets of decisions. In particular, one of the things I sweat all the time is stratification. So what are the, what are the categories you're developing? Okay, and it turns out this ramifies through the entire analytic process when you're developing your models. Like what is the, what is the specific stratum? Are we just looking at months? Or are we looking at quarters? Or are we looking at years? Okay? Because as you get smaller, your error is going to get bigger. But as you get smaller, you get a more precise read, you think, on the story, right? So w if you aggregate, you'll get a smaller error, but then you just get big lumpy lines that don't tell you very much about the change within each of those points. Okay? So if, I only, if we only estimate you know, 2013 for, for Hama, we don't see that bump that we were worried about. And so we won't, we won't be aware of it. But on the other hand, we'll have a much more precise estimate because as you noticed, those error whiskers were gigantic. Okay, turns out they weren't so big that they refute the claim that we made, but they are still pretty big. There's still an awful lot of uncertainty in that estimate. So I think that's right, that's right. And I think there's another, let me flip the question around and answer it in a slightly different way, which is that at one of the talks uh, at the NYU conference a few days ago, on Monday, one of the speakers proposed that his method, the model that he's suggesting, reduces uncertainty for police. Okay, a lot of statisticians and mathematical folks in the room, okay? We trade bias and variance against each other all the time, right? That's what statistical models do. Machine learning models do it, inferential models do it, all of our models trade uncertainty against bias. If you would like to reduce bias, you expand uncertainty, but if you reduce uncertainty, given a specific model and conditional on a particular data set that you're working on, if you reduce uncertainty, you're doing so at the cost of increased bias. Now, first off, I think there's a kind of first, you know, did he know what he was saying? when he said, we're going to reduce uncertainty, thereby shouting to everyone with a statistical ear in the room, and we'll accept all the bias we want, <laughs> which is what I don't think he knew he was saying, but he was saying, which is a problem because he was talking about predictive policing. Okay. But I think there's a policy question there because so when statisticians talk about the trade-off between bias and variance, sometimes it's okay to accept a little bit of bias in order to accept, in order to reduce a lot of variance. And there is an interesting policy debate to be had there about what does it mean to be right? Because there's two different kinds of right that you can be fishing for, both of which are a little bit wrong and a little bit right. So it's not quite as black and white when you get into the statistical details as I would like to portray it here. There is, a, there is a substantial gray area, and far be it from me to say anything other than there is a gigantic smear of probability in between the results. Giant smear of probability. I mean, geez, oh man.
Really? This tiny light purple here, and you're going to pick that middle point? Dude, really? Really? Uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah. So. <laughs> Hi. <clears throat> thank you. So, thank you very much, Patrick. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I, I very much agree that the, so like the future of, of big data work is this notion of sample bias. Um, but however, so the question of whether, whether you're right or wrong, I think is very, like depends a lot on the metric that you use to assess whether you're right or wrong. You said that one of the ways you are right is a census. And I would say it de very much depends on the, on the, on the purpose of, of, of why it's gonna be used for. If you're right or wrong, and you compare whether you're right or wrong, you assess whether you're right or wrong uh, against where do people live on average uh, on July 1st, which on that given year, which is what a census tells you, you're, you can be right or wrong. If it's about, um, well, we, we've talked at length about Haiti, or if, if, if it's about in, in the aftermath of an earthquake, um, I mean, the, the basic question is how much uncertainty are we so like, willing to, to accept? Um, so to what extent, in which conditions or circumstances, some information is better than no information? You said the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, well, and I, and no, I hear, I said, and I hear, I, I no, but I hear the argument. I didn't say information, but yeah, okay. sure, but so, mm -hmm. um, so the, w when, when, so if you use quality records, uh, we know that it's not gonna be statistically uh, representative, uh, and we're working on, you know, like assessing the sample bias, et cetera. Um, but when and how, or how much uncertainty um, are we so like willing to accept depending on, on, on conditions? So, a little backstory here. Manu and I got his PhD in a department in which I'm an adjunct uh, at the University of California, Berkeley in demography. So, census means something very specific to us. I actually mean the larger statistical meaning of a census, which is a complete enumeration of the population of interest, which may be a human population like a census conducted by, you know, the Bureau of the Census, or it might be all the packets that pass through an ISP, or all the people who visit any page, every activity that anyone who visits any page at Amazon, those are what I mean by a census, is perfect data. I entirely agree with you that actual human censuses as practiced by bureaus of the census are not perfect censuses. They are highly imperfect censuses. And in fact, we can just kind of let our minds drift back to the, the, the controversy after the 1990 census and the debate between Ken Wachter and Steve Feinberg about whether or not we should adjust those censuses we have a position in that, which is essentially the methods we use are the same ones that Feinberg proposed for the adjustment of, or the, to a first approximation. They're very similar to what Feinberg proposed for the correction of the U.S. census. So I entirely agree with you, but my, I think the larger point that I'm trying to make here is not that a census is necessarily right, but that a census, if you had a perfect census, you could do anything you like with the analysis. So if you're able to describe all the data that's of any interest to you and that there's nothing hidden, and you can make a strong claim about that, and by a strong claim, I mean you know, a probabilistic claim about that, then you can do anything you like. You don't have to readjust the data again. So this especially, I mean, the, the example that I want to bring up here is the Humanitarian Law Center's database of deaths in Kosovo. If political scientists want to study uh, patterns of violence, that's a database that they can use to feed raw into their regressions and be hardly wrong at all. Okay? Whereas if they use, for example, people listed as killed by Boko Haram in Nigeria as documented in the newspapers, they're going to be completely and utterly wrong because that's a terrible sample. So there's different, you know, the, 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 the Kosovo case is approximately a census, but the, but the media reports on Boko Haram are really bad because we don't know where the media goes, we don't know what they know, we don't know what they don't know. And that's before we even wonder if they're lying or if any of those stories are invented or apocryphal. We don't actually know any of those things. But I'll, I'm going to assume they're all true and just say we don't know what we don't know. So that's what I mean by right, is that you can use these as a starting point for a subsequent analysis that gets you to that right or wrong point, for what, for what it's worth. Let me pick you up on your request to talk about malpractice for a second. Oh, good. <laughs> but I wanna, I wanna drive it in a particular direction. So one of the things that I found interviewing data scientists is that the best data scientists understand the limits of their method. They don't necessarily know the error of their method, but they understand that it has limitations. Yes. They understand the limitations of their sample. They may not know the details of what they're missing, but they understand that there are limitations. Yes. And often they understand the domain in which they're working and understand why some of the things that they're seeing might seem peculiar. That's at the best end of the spectrum. 
And the reality is, is that we are living in a world where because of fetishization of big data, artificial intelligence, and all things uh, sprinkle... Gee whiz um, matrons. Yeah. That's what we call them in my team. That's So gee whiz matrons. <laughs> um, we are having a whole slew of people come into this who don't just not have the statistical training that you expect, but don't even have the sensibilities to ask the questions that are necessary to engage in this. And they are interfacing with a series of people who are selling stories, um, whether we're talking salespeople, whether we're talking right. you know, any number every of Every nonprofit, every, uh, including us. Every government, I mean, a whole <laughs> variety of different versions. And so what's intriguing to me is, is that how do we locate malpractice in this situation? Mm -hmm. Because malpractice in some ways is, is a question of, what do you know because you've been trained to do right. and you are failing to do right because of some Failure. factor? So what is it that you right. are so disproportionately untrained to do along the pipeline that you actually, it's, it's, there's a responsibility to figure out how we start training and holding accountable, not just as malpractice, but as, as a systemic level. Mm -hmm. So help me figure out where you place accountability as you start to think about malpractice. So Dana, you and I live in at opposite ends of a spectrum, which is we both will see a problem and then we run to the opposite corners of the room. Okay, I run to the smallest possible way that we might answer some tiny little crumb of that question exactly right. Tiniest little bit. And I'm like, this one's right. Okay, we have a fixed point now. And you, I think, often run to the other corner of like, what's the strategic response that would fix the whole problem? <laughs> I really admire that. Um, you know, Cindy does it too. She's, you guys are geniuses at it. I got nothing. I got nothing. What I think is that there, malpractice is the, uh, is, 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 is the problem that occurs when people purport to hold expertise and use that expertise to create something that seems like knowledge and they give that knowledge to unsuspecting people who know they don't have that expertise and have no way to assess whether or not the knowledge is true. And then those people have to make life decisions or career decisions or NGO decisions or major decisions that affect them on the basis of the expert knowledge that they've received. That's what I think malpractice is. It, it occurs at that juncture. And that's why we have this notion of malpractice, particularly in law and medicine, which are giant fields of expert knowledge Okay? I'm not proposing any kind of bureaucratic thing. In fact, I'm not really proposing anything, except that we need to think about it. And I'm really hoping that people who have that strategic vision, unlike myself, but very much like you, and like Dr. Price, and like Councillor Cohen, can carry that forward. But I think that we need to start talking about bad data analysis, not as, oopsie, but as, you've hurt something. You have damaged the legitimacy of your client. You have not helped them by presenting a, 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 a whizzy, visualization or a really cool analysis, unless you've made sure that it's right, unless you've figured out if you have one of these three foundations for the data and you've been able to propagate the uncertainty to the, to the client. Otherwise, I think we have, a, we have a malpractice situation. How we do that, <laughs> help me out. You've got the Data and Society Institute. We're just statist simple country statisticians. That's all we are. <laughs> Hi, Patrick. I would like to put on my hat as an anthropologist and ask you a question from that space. Um, so one of the things I'd like you to do is to help me separate the passion you feel for good statistics and the passion that you're asking us to feel for these political issues. The critique that you've levered could be levered at any statistical case but you're talking about a certain set of issues. Mm -hmm. And where I want to challenge you is this idea of accountability. Who's, who benefits from this political position of accountability? Because if you're dead, accountability is too late for you. So what is it that you're defending when you say that accountability is the bottom line on politics? And then, you know, because there are some really beautiful case studies in anthropology where what they do is they show that the process by which not being counted happens is an active process, it's mm -hmm. not just a, mm -hmm. a negative, and that, and that that's what's at stake, mm -hmm. is that, you, that the, the reason why these cases are outrageous is because precisely they happen at that fringe where 
being governed and not being governed, being counted and not being counted, is so messy that the reinforcement of good Sorry, statistics I, I'm, to I, me. I have to start writing down in my head the things you're saying. So unpack accountability, Columbia anecdote, and, uh, and counted and not counted and who's counting. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> but the reinforcement of good statistics is, is very suspicious to me <laughs> because that's about, that's about mainstream practice. The idea mm -hmm. that we need to reinforce good statistics yeah. leaves me uneasy. That's what I would say. Fair enough. Um, I think we need to first talk about, we need to unpack uh, the notion of accountability, okay? Talk about who's being held accountable and for what. And I've proposed at least two different kinds and probably more because people who are taking better notes will have better memories than I do. But at least two different kinds of accountability. The first is accountability of senior military and police officials for gross human rights violations, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide. That's the kind of accountability that I spend my days working toward. And I don't think that, we would, that you would object to that kind of accountability. Um, I'm not talking about accountability for uh, powerless people. I, that, I, I'm specifically talking about accountability of the powerful for their actions. Um, essentially, none of these projects have been done with anything other than the weakest of partnerships with any government. We do these for non-governmental processes as well as extra-governmental processes that are uh, doing tribunals to hold government officials accountable. All of our work is about that. The exception is when we're contrasting quasi-state institutions or institutions that purport to stand as a state, like Sendero Luminoso, or perhaps in the future Daesh, uh, they were standing in a quasi-state situation. So we might also hold insurgents accountable, but only in these in very narrow circumstances defined by international humanitarian law when they take on quasi-state status. So that's one kind of accountability. And I'm pretty comfortable uh, defending that as an action in favor of the powerless. Second kind of accountability, a little more complicated, which is that I'm proposing a kind of accountability for data scientists to make sure that we're getting the story right. That's a lot more inchoate, and as the exchange with Dana just a second ago kind of illustrated, I don't really have any idea even how to start talking about it as a strategic goal. All I am able to do at this point is identify that there's an issue and perhaps put a little bit of language around what the issue is. I'm pretty comfortable with that accountability too, precisely for demanding that kind of accountability too, precisely because we have expertise and we're getting more and more and more expertise. And our partners, clients, customers, whatever it is that they are in, in different kinds of relationships are not gonna have that expertise. That's why they sought it from us. So they won't know if we're right. They'll have no way to assess or very little way to assess without contracting with a second opinion if we've done a good job for them. So I think we need to start talking about norms in our field as an ethical foundation to figure out how we hold ourselves accountable for doing the right thing, for doing analysis that is in fact rigorous. Now let's step back to your question about people who evade being counted. That's actually what motivated me to do this. When I was working at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa in 1998, we had about 14,000 testimonies that people had given to us over the course of the TRC's work. And that was in July, July 1997 actually, okay? Is that right? Am I getting all the dates right? Yes, July 1997. And then a political decision got made at Inkata, at the Inkata Freedom Party, that they were going to, after many months of deciding to not participate with the TRC, they decided to participate in the TRC. And we got over 8,000 testimonies in the last few months of the commission's life. Right before we closed the doors, all of a sudden, boom, this enormous amount more data. You know, half again the data that we had landed in our laps. And all the graphs and statistics just went wonkity wonk, flippity flop, cattywampus. They all changed completely. And I was like, oh boy. And that was the moment that I realized, hang on, all our results depend entirely on who we talk to. Now you're right, there are some people who for a variety of reasons would prefer to not be captured in these data systems. And let me tell you the story of one of them. And this comes from 2006. I was working with a group of families of the disappeared in uh, Medellin, Colombia. I spent 2006 teaching statistics at the National University in Colombia and at uh, an NGO, the Colombian Commission of Juris. And part of my work was this outreach project where we'd go to uh, local human rights groups and talk to them about statistics. And a woman came up to me after the session and she said, you know, I really appreciate this. She was part of this family's that disappeared. So she's very actively trying to get this documentation done. Not for counting purposes, but for historical memory purposes. She's like, I really am glad you're doing this. And the reason is that I know a lot of people in my village who don't want to be part of us, don't want to be part of our group. They think all we're going to do is bring more violence to the village. They don't want to be part of this at all. 
but at least, and, and their, their family members therefore go undocumented and disappear from historical memory, but at least they should be counted. It is the minimum we owe people to at least remember that they existed as magnitude, if not by name, and I, I would hope by name, and we support every, every effort to document people by name, but sometimes not even, we can't get that, and so we have to do it only by their magnitude. And I remember uh, that interaction with her all the time when we're doing this work because we have to remember that at least these people existed in the aggregate, at minimum. That's the least we can possibly do. The really just the tiniest thing we can do. So I sympathize with that. We could also talk about Congo in 2009 with the blanketing of cell phone coverage in Eastern Congo in 2009 that didn't really change reporting from the local areas at all. I agree, reporting is not a technology problem. Reporting is an entirely a social problem, and it comes with a very careful calculus on the basis of the people who are deciding whether or not they want to be documented, whether or not this information will benefit them. Very careful. I am not naive about that. Quite to the contrary, I have a lot of think, I've done a lot of thinking about why it is that some people decide to give their testimonies to, to denounce violence against them and their families, and other people don't. But I think that even if they don't, we have a kind of crisis of the commons. We have to at least consider them in the aggregate even if we don't consider their cases. Mm -hmm. So we're unfortunately out of time, um, but hopefully Patrick will be able to stick around for a little bit if you guys want to come up and ask totally. him questions afterwards. Um, let's thank him again.